Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, my name is Neil. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Neil. Um, I have, I've never been to this meeting before. I've, I've uh, heard it many times on the podcast, so I feel like I've been in this room, but I didn't know what it looked like. Um, uh, my sobriety date is 10-29-15, so I'm a little over two years. Um, I am very uncomfortable being the center of attention, so I'm very nervous and very uncomfortable. But I'm going to share anyway. Um, and so what it was like was for me, um, I did not have a super dramatic and low bottom uh, with lots of uh, dramatic consequences and relationships, you know, run through the, through the garbage and uh, loss of health and things like that. Um, I grew up with my mom in the program. Uh, she got sober when I was in middle school and I remember what she was like when she was drinking and I remember, and then I more remember her transition into sobriety being maybe even more tumultuous. Um, so I had a really, um, early education. Uh, I, I had other family members who were, uh, addicts and abusers and in various stages of recovery. Uh, so it was always this scary adult world thing to me of, um, addiction and recovery, and uh, and yet I still didn't re- really fear that it was going to happen to me, that it could happen to me. I think I was uh, conscious of the risk when I started drinking in my teens and into college, and uh, when, I, when I left school was when I really kind of got into the... Uh, the the groove of drinking every day, drinking all the time, uh, not all the time, not twenty four hours a day, but I, I, I kept with me this fear of the idea of addiction and and what what that looked like, and um, and so I was in my mind careful, um, but uh, but it didn't matter, you know. Uh, over the over the years, I kept putting those bricks in the wall and. Um, and realized, I think, in my 30s that I was definitely not in control of my drinking and uh, that I, when I wanted to stop, I couldn't. I tried to control my drinking. I tried to control the amount of power that it had over me, and I wasn't very good at that, uh, and that was scary. So fast forward to uh, two years ago, um, how I got sober was by carefully circling around the idea of asking for help. No one, no one in my life was telling me you're out of control. You're a problem. You know, you're hurting people, you're hurting yourself because I was really careful. I like to drink socially, uh, but I liked even more to drink alone, uh, and to, to guard myself, to hide my behavior, uh, to hide how much I really liked it and how much I wanted it all the time. So I was good at hiding it. And, uh, uh, the more powerless I felt over that need to, to have it be a bigger and bigger part of my life, the narrower my world felt, the more isolation and powerlessness started to seem a part of my life and a part of my future, uh, it, it just, it started to become very demoralizing and I hated the idea that I, I had to admit that I was powerless and that I had to submit to this 12 step program, this AA life that I had watched when I was a kid, um, with kind of fear and, and confusion. Um, and I was, I was terrified. I was terrified of needing to turn my life into that. Um, so I had to figure out how to ask for help. And that was my, uh, that was my biggest challenge. That remains a big challenge for me. Um, so I, what I did was, uh, kind of picked a day on the calendar that made sense to me 
and uh, didn't tell anybody, didn't tell my wife, didn't tell my friends, didn't tell the other people that I knew in my life who were sober. I, I had friends at work or, you know, certainly my, my mom, who I'm still, you know, I still have a relationship with. Uh, I didn't I didn't talk to any of them about my my concern and my my goal to get sober um, because I that's my problem. That's part of my problem is I I'm, I have a real hard time reaching out to anybody around me for help. Um, so I picked this day. I, it was a day where I could leave work early. Um, I was, uh, it was supposed to be involved in this big Halloween party, uh, th that day. And I, I, it's a very, you know, booze ridden thing at work, lots of drinking, lots of rowdiness. And I just said, you know, fuck it. I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to stay home. I'm going to cut out on that and I'm going to sneak off to an AA meeting and just see what it's like. And, uh, and that's what I did. I, I had looked, I was really nervous and fearful, uh, about that AA was going to force me to deal with religion because personally for me, I was not a religious person. Uh, I was raised Catholic and I was, I had a very strong resistance to it since I was, I don't know, in my twenties. And I, I was petrified that I knew I needed this help, but that I, I couldn't stomach someone telling me that in order to get help, I had to believe in, you know, Christian, Christian religion. Um, so that was this huge, fearful barrier t for me. Uh, and I, I found a meeting on the schedule that claimed it was an atheist agnostic meeting. And I thought that might be some kind of trick to get me in the room, but it, it gave me the hope to see that there might be a way it was like a gap that I might be able to slide through. And, uh, that was incredibly valuable to me. Uh, it was the godless heathens meeting on Wednesday night for anybody who feels like me. Uh, it's a great meeting. And, um, I, I didn't actually get to that meeting. That wasn't my first meeting. I called the hotline and I just said, tell me what to do. You know, I need to go to a meeting today. And, uh, it was a Thursday, so it wasn't the right day. Um, but I went, into this meeting and I was shaking and terrified and, uh, freaked out and sat through it quietly in the back of the room. And, uh, as soon as it was over, I felt, uh, an immediate sense of like, holy shit, I did this. I did it. And I, no one told me what to do. No one got in my face. No one <laughs> tried to take control of my life. And, and I didn't drink that night and I didn't want to drink that night. And I thought that was pretty incredible. Um, and so I did it again. I went to another meeting the next night and I didn't drink that night either. And, uh, and that was probably more sobriety than I had in years, two nights in a row. So I was pretty convinced immediately there was something going on and, uh, and I've stuck with it. Um, I'm not even on time. Two more minutes. Okay. So what, that was my, how I, how I got through the original hump. I'm still going strong. And I, uh, my life right now, I work with a sponsor. Uh, I worked the 12 steps, um, but I didn't do it all at once. I literally, I think I crossed the 12 step mark four months ago, something like that. Five months ago. Uh, I, I, the sponsor that I found after a few months in the program, uh, has been very patient with me, hasn't pushed me, uh, hasn't pushed me in a way that has made me feel threatened or, you know, uh, jumpy and jittery. Uh, I, he's worked with me in the way that I needed. And that was just incredibly valuable. It made all the difference to find the willingness. Cause that's the other thing that I have now that I try to incorporate into my life is why I'm speaking in this huge room full of people, uh, is that I, I have tried to find willingness to do things that are uncomfortable, but that are suggested to me because they're part of, uh, what has helped other people. And my higher power is, is the group is, is AA is all of you. And I, I need to rely on my p higher power. I need to follow suggestions. I need to I need to show willingness and it has given me two plus years of sobriety It's given me a lot of gifts already. Uh, it's, I've learned so much about myself. 
I'm willing to examine myself. Um, I'm willing to, to put some work in. And that's not, the, it's not that much work. It's a little bit at a time. And, uh, and just, you know, okay, I did something great. That feels good. <laughs> now I can, now I can rest for today and maybe try something again tomorrow. Uh, I don't, I, uh, yeah, I've worked with people, uh, including my sponsor and other f- mentors in the program, who have who have shown me that a, a little bit at a time you build, you build slowly, and it and it has kept me sober, and I'm so grateful for it. Thank you. Hi, my name is Connie. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Always grateful to be in a meeting with Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I'm a very, very, very grateful alcoholic. Um, you know, when people used to say that, there, I guess sometimes people have different meanings when they say that. Um, like, grateful to be an alcoholic, or grateful to be an Alcoholics Anonymous. It really doesn't matter to me. Um, I'm here because this is where my higher power has me. And, um, and I have a relationship with the higher power that... Um, gives me everything that I need, and for me, that's the most important thing. Whatever I need to know, I know will be given to me in the moment that I need it. And so um, let me qualify by saying that um, I have a sobriety date of October 13th, 2005. Um, I actually chaired this meeting about a year ago, and um, if it had been any less time than a year, I would have said no, but... um, it was kind of the cutoff point, and I was really excited at the um, end of a meeting uh, that I secretary on Wednesday nights, the double digits. I had an excellent speaker. The mood in the room was just awesome and electric, and um, the person afterwards asked me, and I said, okay, yeah, I was in a great mood and happy, and, you know, am I going to say no? <laughs> no, I'm not, you know? Um so, so I'm here. So I, I apologize for anybody who has who seen me last year and is like, "Oh, I'm disappointed" or whatever. It's okay. I've I've had those experiences where I thought I would be disappointed, and I was really excited to know that, you know, I have when I keep an open mind, then new experiences happen all the time. And um, I was uh, I was chairing in a meeting in Sausalito about a week ago, and um, somebody had said, oh, you know, it's going to be a meeting full of old white people. And so, like, when when I heard that, like, I kind of got this preconceived idea, like, oh, like, what am I going to have to, like, relate to those people? Um, and so what I did was, like, I said this prayer to, like, God, please ha- have me have an open mind, an open heart, and be an open vessel so that I can impart a message of whatever it is, not like, what, it's not about me. It's about this disease and what we do for each other. You know, as um, one alcoholic working with another alcoholic, our experience, strength, and hope. Um, so let me kind of just uh, go to what it was like. Um, I always start off by saying I was born to two very young parents. Uh, my mom was 13 and my dad was 14. When I was born um, in the '60s, in the '60s, that wasn't something that was acceptable. And because they weren't married, I was taken into foster care um, when I was a year old, and I had a lot of trauma as a result of that from the very beginning of my life. And of course, that doesn't make me an alcoholic. Um, the fact that I was raised around a lot of drugs and alcohol doesn't make me an alcoholic. Um, I have this disease because I have this disease. Um, Maybe there's some genetics involved because I have a long family history of drugs and alcohol. Um, It was an acceptable thing when I was growing up to drink and do drugs. In fact, it was my parents let me party with them as a child. And so um, for a very long time, I had no idea that I actually had the disease because I didn't... To me, my life didn't look like what I thought an alcoholic's life looked like. Um, I was functioning. I had, you know, two children that I was raising. Um, I raised them as Jehovah's Witnesses. I was faithful in that religion for 15 years. Um, And I always say that religion never saved me from the disease of alcoholism. Um, 
uh, like I said, I was partying at a very early age with adults. I was in full-blown alcoholism by the time I was 12. I did things um, that brought um, the demoralization, the incomprehensible demoralization that, um, like, I just wanted to bury so much of who I was during that time that I effectively did just that. I, um, I decided that I was going to, like, totally change who I was. I chopped off my hair. I had long hair. I chopped it off to the neck and with my own scissors, as you can imagine what that looked like. And, um, and I did that because I was, um, I was in Berkeley at a Hare Krishna temple, and that's what this woman did. So I'm like, I'm going to do that, you know. And, um, and I was jumping around chanting at the Hare Krishna temple, having a great time and losing myself in the spirit. And um, that kind of was my move away from doing you know, the drug and alcohol scene and changing who I was. And, um, you know, I was sexually abused as a child, so um, becoming sexually active as a young person, you know, barely, like, again, I was I was 12 when I started having sex, and um, and not with young men either, with, with adults. And um, so I... Like I said, I had a lot of incomprehensible demoralization, and I didn't feel good about who I was, and um, and I wanted to, like, live a different way. And so I did seek some kind of spiritual solution. Um, I started getting into Eastern religion, and um, after the Hare Krishna thing, I started, um, I was introduced to an Indian guru in San Francisco in an open meditation where he was taking disciples. And um, so I, I had a private meditation, and, you know, a few nights later, they call you up and say if you've been accepted, and I was accepted, and, um, and I started um, meditating under this guru in this ashram in San Francisco. I was about 15 when, when I did that, and, um, and I became a vegetarian, and, um, you know, our guru required us to run two miles a day, so I started running. I got into track and cross country. Um, you know, I did very well in school, and then, you know, when I became a senior in high school, I like, thought, I'm okay, you know. I, I can I can smoke weed I can I can drink because I didn't think I was an alcoholic I just wanted to kind of change who I was and I and I did that I transformed my life and I buried all that other kind of stuff that I didn't want to like that wasn't me anymore so if I just buried it far enough down nobody's gonna know right not even me I won't even look that was kind of what what my coping mechanism was. I'm not going to look, and if I don't look at it, if I just kind of reconstruct it, then it, it's it's not going to exist. Well, that wasn't really the truth. Um, so I started drinking again, um, like, like I said, in, as a senior in high school, and I started smoking weed, and 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 I felt like this really, really empty spot inside of myself, that hole that they talk about, um, that God-shaped hole. And, um, like, so I wasn't going to, I wasn't meditating anymore. I was still running, and um, I was going to college at Cal State Hayward. I was um, running track and cross country for, for, for Cal State. And um, after about, I was about a sophomore when I started, like, feeling like super lonely. I had moved out on my own and I, I lived in a, a studio uh, right by Lake Merritt and, and I never wanted to be at home. I just felt like really super lonely. And um, so I, you know, I started hanging around with my cousins who, um, you know, just did the big party thing all the time. And um, uh, I ended up meeting my cousin's best friend who um, I ended up getting together with and um, you know and so I was drinking a lot I was doing some drugs um, you know I was again dipping into behavior that I wouldn't normally dip into if I had been sober and um, so 
I got together with um, this young man who is the father of my two children, and um, he was in the beginning of his crack career. That's what I call it. Because you know he was young, and and I was young, and I didn't even know what crack was, um, but. He brought it into our home when we moved together, and um, my son was just a baby. And you know, and he offered it to me, and and I tried it, and um, and it didn't really do anything to me. Thank goodness, because um, you know, I shudder to think what our life, what my children's life would be like if both of us started on that path. So um, I, I right away I was just like this isn't right, and I, I was I was just like no this is not acceptable, and um, and I didn't want him to do it in the house anymore, and so he kind of went underground with it, and um, and our lives were just really really erratic, you know you you know the the behavior of somebody who's doing those kind of drugs is that they become you know extreme, paranoid, um, violent, and and so I experienced the backlash of that. Um, my son was, he was under a year old when we got into a fight, and, um, and he knocked out my two front teeth, and um, he went to jail, and, you know, and I was miserable. I was just completely miserable. I just... I couldn't live with him, and I couldn't live without him. And so I was in this real, really sick place where I just felt inside like nothing could make me feel whole. Like I was just, like I just really didn't want to be alive. And um, and that's when a friend of mine that I worked with started, you know, asking if I wanted to study the Bible with her as a Jehovah's Witness. So I was like, okay. And so I did that, and, um, and, you know, I remember thinking that, like, if I can't drink, you know, there's not going to be any fun in my life. Um, but, you know, that's that was all I thought. I didn't really, I didn't think that, like, I can't live with alcohol, but I just had that thought, like, life is going to be kind of boring without, without being able to drink. And so... Um, and I still did drink. I just didn't drink alcoholically. And, and that's one of the reasons why I didn't think that I had the disease. And, and that's why this disease is so cunning, baffling, and powerful is because we have a, an idea, a, a preconceived idea of exactly what it is. Um, but when you take the drugs and the alcohol away, the problem is what the problem is. That's the ism. It's not about the, the drugs and alcohol or what we do to change how we feel, to, um, to have a solution to the problem that the disease causes inside, um, that irritable, restless, and discontent. That's how I felt, you know. And even when I was, when I was you know, loyal in going to the Jehovah's Witness thing, I would wake up feeling like that impending doom, like there was something very, very wrong, and I didn't, I couldn't name it. I didn't know what it was, but I just know that I felt it. I didn't feel spiritually connected. I didn't feel like there was enough things that I could do to make me be okay inside. And um, eventually, you know, after about 17 years. We had been together 17 years, married for 15. Um, you know, the abuse just was cycling down to my children. You know, um, he didn't hit me anymore, but the emotional abuse was was always there. And he had a really short fuse. And, you know, um, he was always, you know, over me, telling me how I should do things. And, um, you know, I needed to come home and cook. And, you know, and blah, 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 you know, and the house had to be super clean. And mind you, I'm a clean freak anyway. And he's, you know, getting the white glove out and doing, you know, just just being an asshole pretty much. And um, so I, I had enough, enough. When my children started to show, like, 
it wasn't it wasn't the happy family that I wanted to keep together. That was the, the reason really why I stayed so long was one reason was that they the Jehovah's Witness said that I the only way that you could leave a marriage is if the partner um, you know was uh, not faithful. And of course he was never going to say that he wasn't faithful. I don't know if he was or not, but he, you know he would be out drinking late at night. Um, after work, saying he was working overtime, and you know now now I know that was a lie, but at the time I couldn't prove it. Um, but I just knew that you know it was a pretty miserable kind of way of living, with him being a rageaholic and um, a binge crack addict and a really heavy really heavy drinker, and um, you know he started to get DUIs and then. You know, he got pulled over, and he says, oh, I was dr just drinking old duels. And um, it's like, okay, yeah. Like, he thought I was going to believe everything that he said. And you know what? The point is that it really didn't matter if I believed him or not because he felt like I w there was nothing I could do. I could go nowhere, you know? I was, I was stuck. But um, you can only be stuck for so long until you, until you realize enough is enough. And so um, I left that marriage after 17 years. Um, I had a daughter and a son. And um, like I said, I raised them with the Bible. I was very faithful. And um, after, after their dad left, I started drinking again. I started drinking to cover up the, hate, the, the pain that I felt, the loss that I felt, the disconnection that I felt like I didn't know who I was. I just felt completely lost, and um, and I started going out to the bar, and um, you know I started coming home really late. I started closing down the bar. I started making the bar a regular place that I was hanging out, and I ended up picking up husband number two in the bar, and um, and he was you know selling meth. And again, I didn't know what meth was. <laughs> A little pattern here, right? So, <laughs> so um, yeah, and he said he wasn't smoking it. He was just selling it. But again, there was this huge, like, behaviors that would come out. Again, he was really erratic and, and violent and... Um, and I decided, like, you know, he got arrested, and, um, he, you know, he was in jail, and I bailed him out of jail. Mind you, I'm barely able to keep a roof over my head, but I bail him out of jail. And um, and then, you know, he gets out, and, and they said, well, you have a pretty good case since, you know, somebody bailed you out. They usually give you a lighter sentence because they know you have somebody who's going to take care of you or who's going to be there for you. And so... Um, you know, I was like really super crazy, miserable, and um, you know, I was crying. My mom was down visiting from Arizona, and I was just like, I, I just want to go to the hospital. I just wanted to die. I was just so lost and miserable, and in a lot of pain. And um, my aunt, who's been in the program for thirty years now, um, took me to an Al-Anon meeting. And, and I felt some relief there, you know, and, and I went to Al-Anon for about a year and a half, and um, and I was still pretty spun out in my head. And I was still going to the bar, you know, I was on the pool league, I was just having a grand old time, and, um, but again, like, the grand old time, coming home, being, having these hellacious hangovers, uh, being in situations where I could have really, you know, dangerous situations where I... I by the grace of God, I didn't have consequences that could have been a lot worse, a lot worse. Um, and so um, I, I went to Al-Anon. I, I, I woke up one morning really, really spun out in my head and miserable and decided I was going to go to an AA meeting because there wasn't an Al-Anon meeting available. So I went to um, central office, a 9 o'clock meeting, and... Um, and I felt some immediate relief there. And and at the end of the meeting, you know, I they said, you know, is there any a newcomer or whatever? I don't know why I said I raised my hand and said, 
I don't know if I'm an alcoholic, but I feel I feel some connection here and some relief. And they said, keep coming back. And so that's exactly what I did. I, I kept coming back, and they said the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking. And so I was like, I can do that. I, I, I'll do anything because I was so miserable. I, I, I literally just wanted to kill myself, but I couldn't. You know, I have two children and, you know, my family. And I, and I was afraid that if I tried to kill myself that I wouldn't end up making it and I'd just be some maimed person or, you know, <laughs> something would happen where I would just be worse off with the attempt to commit suicide because I had tried to commit suicide as a young as a young person and almost did succeed, but so, um, I started going to AA. Um, I immediately got a sponsor. They opened up the book. They showed me the varieties of alcoholics. Um, and I indeed fit into, you know, I found myself in the book. I, I, I was, uh, I seen that I was like the, that periodic drinker who could leave it alone for a while, but then once they started drinking, um, you know, alcoholically, the, the consequences got worse and worse, and, um, you know, the disease is progressive, and I definitely felt the progression in my life. Um, it was only about a year and a half when I was going to the bar that I felt like this immediately died, nosedive, that my life was totally, you know... I had no control over my emotional bottom. It was a deep, deep emotional bottom where I was in deep pain and um, and I needed help. And so, um, like I said, I came in, I started working with the sponsor. Um, I, I started going to a lot of meetings. I got into service right away. Um, I felt super inadequate about doing service, um, but because I was in so much pain, they suggested, well, why don't you try H&I so you can get out of yourself? And I'm like, okay, I'll do that. And so um, I, I went to the uh, food and housing shelter for women in, in Berkeley, and I did that, that commitment. And um, even though I felt inadequate, I, I did it. Uh, I started you know, sponsoring women shortly after that. And, um, you know, after all these years, I still have that gift of desperation. I still feel that the disease of disconnection can happen to me at any point, you know, through, through all, throughout all of this time. I have never, you know, taken, like, meetings for granted, like, oh, I don't need to go anymore. Never, because I've always, this disease has always been such, so much work to get that kind of inside job done that I had to keep coming back to keep my sanity. Um, and um, so that's what I've been doing. You know, I, I sponsor women. I have service commitments always. Um, I go to a lot of meetings. And the fact is that I really, truly appreciate being here. I appreciate, you know, my community. I appreciate that I belong here and that I have people who understand what, I t what, what I'm talking about when I talk about the symptoms of this disease. You know, I don't, like, I don't tell the people that I work with that I'm an alcoholic. And I don't tell them because I'm ashamed of it. And I don't tell them because I'm afraid of what they might think. Um, but I don't know. I think the main reason I don't say that I am because it's not necessary. You know, if somebody asked me, I would, I would definitely, um, I would say so. Um, but I think I don't really want them to, to color their judgment about me. And I don't think that, that they necessarily would, but you know, maybe somebody might have a prejudgment of what they think an alcoholic is. Um, and, and if the day comes where that situation happens, I'll be glad to, you know, be exactly who I am. I'm not afraid to be who I am and to say the truth. Um, that just happens to be what the situation is for me today. Actually, I'm very, very proud of being a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm very proud of what we do here. Um, I, I think that the recovery that I've gotten here has been, has offered me some really, really deep healing. 
I, I've gotten outside help. I, I was in therapy for about 10 of my 12 years here. Um, and, you know, I, I got my feel of what I thought therapy could do for me. And, um, you know, I had situations which brought me to my knees where I had to um, develop a faith in a higher power that was stronger than anything that I've ever had before. And today that's exactly, um, that's exactly where I am. I'm, I'm in this kind of spiritual quest to um, have a connection with the higher power that is beyond what they talk about spiritual kindergarten in the book. You know, we have to enlarge on our spirituality. And, um, and that's what I do. I, I regularly, every day, I pray for God to, how can I be of service, you know, um, help me to get out of the way. Um, my thoughts are not a place where things are manageable. <laughs> Yeah, the, the disease centers in the mind, and so um, the disease is alive and well. And so that's why I have to do so much work to stay um, emotionally sober and to um, to keep myself away from the idea that taking my life is a better idea than living. Um, that's where the disease takes me. I know that um, taking a drink is not going to be helpful to me, um, because the progression of the disease is, is super, super quick when you come back after, you know, leaving it. They say that it's, if it's not exactly where you left off, it's, you know, even more increased. And, um, and I shudder to think where I would go if I did that, you know. I would probably just, I heard somebody talk about how they uh, got into their car, closed their eyes, and ran into a tree. And lived. <laughs> and um, I would hate to be that person who who did that, and and then had to to face the you know how the world would look like to me after that. For me, doing the inside work is um, a much better option. And for me, it's peeling back that onion. It's looking at the things that cause me fear. It's um, touching that fear. It's walking through the fear. It's, um, you know, looking at the stuff that is not so pretty to look at. And, and to be honest with myself, like, you know, I don't want to be that way. You know, I don't want to be that kind of a person that I don't feel good about. And it doesn't really matter what, what the world sees because I can put on this really pretty picture. <sighs> But if I don't like it, it's my conscience, it's my higher power telling me, you got to go deeper. Yeah. It's, a, it's that spiritual place that, that I've come to in doing this work, which means there's a lot more to keep going on. You know, I, I, haven't, I haven't gotten to this place where, I'm, where, I've, um, where I've reached the, the end of the line, you know. I've done all the work and I'm done, you know, and, um, and I'm okay because I'm not okay. Um, I'm better. I'm much better. I'm, I'm in a much more healed place. I feel much more grounded. Um, but if I ever feel like that's enough, then, um, I can go into the quicksand anytime. And, um, so I have like about eight more minutes left and... <laughs> So let me just kind of um, talk about what I do today, some of the practices that I have. One of the practices that I have been um, using um, for, for some time now is um, to learn how to be still with myself um, when I'm feeling lonely, when I'm feeling angry, when I'm feeling hurt. Um, you know, for a long time, I, I wouldn't even allow myself to feel any anger because I thought it was such a destructive emotion that um, I felt like it's useless. Um, and you know, when I was in therapy, my therapist said, what? You don't feel anger. She said, that's not normal. And, and you know, and I, it never really dawned on me until she said that, that, you know, really, that is a little, a little strange. 
Um, but I really didn't think that much about it. But as I've been doing this work, um, I actually have been starting to feel anger more. And, um, and that gives me an idea that I'm actually starting to free myself from a lot of the control issues that I kind of had. I, if I controlled everything, um, then nobody really has to know what's inside. The truth is, is that I know what's inside. And if I'm feeling angry about something, if I'm feeling um, disturbed about something, um, the 10th step tells us that, you know, it, um, that I have to go inside and, and see what it is. You know, that's, it's a spiritual malady, this disease. And um, the solution is a spiritual solution. And the work is that I go inside and see what the causes and conditions are. The causes and conditions of this disease, they're not alcohol and drugs. Those are the solutions that we use. The causes and conditions are, you know, my fear, my extreme, um, how, well, how, can I, how can I distract myself from feeling the feelings that I have? Which, you know, that's what, what alcohol did. It helped me to you know, numb out or whatever, or, or try to escape, you know, it, we want to change how we feel. That's what this disease does. You know, it's normal. Human beings want to change how the, the way they feel, but we go to extremes to change the way that we feel. I would get lost in relationships, you know, um, I would get lost in religion, you know, I could get lost in exercise. I can get lost in anything, but today I don't want to be lost. Today, I want to be free. And so, today, I have a much, I'm much more closer to freedom than I ever have been. I have um, a place where I feel centered. I, I pray and I meditate and um, I do yoga. And um, yoga has been great to really help me to release a lot of the pent up energy that has kind of been stuck in there. Um, I, I have a much more open mind. Um, I practice letting go for real. Um, like that stuff really eluded me in the beginning. Like, how do I let go? I had no idea. I wanted to, but I was stuck. I was just like really, really stuck. Like I want to let this shit go, but I can't. And so the practice is that I keep, sh I keep coming back. I keep showing up. I keep having willingness I do what's suggested, and um, and I give it to God, and God does the rest. And it's been my experience that that works. Um, it's also been my experience that it's not easy. You know, uh, I'll be one of the hardest times that I have is when I'm in bed at night and I'm trying to sleep. Um, you know, I'll be tossing and turning, and you know, the the mind will be, you know running its little tails and driving me crazy and um, and I have to hold back and I have to just I have to let th that storyline stop where it's at and ask God to um, direct my thoughts and and it's a, it sounds really simple but when I'm in a lot of pain because that stuff comes up that's inside that's been buried for so long, it's it's the, the stuff that's really, really deep down there is the stuff that's coming up that's really bothering my spirit. Um, I that stuff I have to give to God. And um, and that's what I've been doing and um, and it's working. It really is. It's it's very painful, um, and it's very difficult. But the, the things that I learned here in this program is that if I keep showing up and if I have a willingness and an openness and I turn it over and let God, it actually works. But the thing is, it works in God's time, not my time. So that's where it takes the patience. So anyway, I hope you guys weren't too bored with my share. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.